Now the Three Martini Lunch with Greg Columbus and Jim Garrity. And welcome everyone to the Monday edition of the Three Martini Lunch. Eliana Johnson of National Review, the brand new Washington Bureau Chief for National Review, and for Jim Garrity today, who will be back later in the week. Uh, Eliana, thanks very much for being with us. Thanks so much for having me, Greg. Great to be with you. And congratulations on the promotion. We have just about two weeks left until the midterm elections. And one of the things that the Democrats are worried about, of course, is getting their base out to the polls. That's a big deal in the midterm elections. And the New York Times is trying to help them along by saying, hey, the thing that's going to determine whether the Democrats keep the Senate or not is the minority vote and specifically the black vote. And so that's obviously where they're going to be targeting a lot of their efforts for get out the vote in the coming days. But dumping a huge bucket of cold water on that strategy is Tavis Smiley. No conservative, if anyone's been following Tavis Smiley over the years. Not a lot of kind words for the administration on how it's treated black folks over the past six years. Let's be frank about this. If you're black or brown, other than helping to save the Democrats hide, give me three good reasons that you turn out to vote this time. I'm not suggesting that people ought to stay home and sit on their hands. What I'm suggesting is that neither party has focused clearly enough on the issues of black and brown voters to inspire them and motivate them to turn out in 2014. And we may see the same thing in 2016. And that was on ABC's This Week program. So, Eliana, that's not exactly the uh, messaging that the Democrats are hoping for when they see a guy like Tavis Smiley on the panel on a Sunday morning show. You know, it's interesting, Greg, Um, a few times over the past six years, we've seen African-American constituency that's basically considered a lock by Democrats express their deep frustration and displeasure uh, with the president in particular. You saw Maxine Waters do it uh, at a meeting of the Congressional Black Caucus. Uh, saying basically that the president hasn't done enough for African Americans. And uh, you've seen people like Jesse Jackson express the same sentiment. So uh, I think that sentiment sort of percolates and comes uh, to public view uh, every so often. And you have to think that it's more widespread, that sort of anger and discontent, is more widespread within the politicized African-American community than uh, than ever really lets on. And if you remember when Maxine Waters said that, she was mocked by the president. So I think that has to have led to um, a, a whole lot of anger and resentment. The president disowning Jeremiah Wright, he has not aligned himself with radical African-Americans, um, with the exception of Al Sharpton, I would say. I think that's a separate issue from the Obama administration's um, and the Obama campaign's very skillful micro-targeting and mobilization of black voters, because I think these very politicized African Americans, the sort of leaders of the black community, are are not the same um, as the Obama campaign's arm or mobilization effort, which is quite separate. Yeah, a lot of different factors here. Number one, he's not on the ballot, and he obviously draws a larger percentage of black votes than than any candidates at the state or or local level. And then you factor in, like you were just talking about, and Tavis Smiley was talking about, that uh, folks have just not been treated well, whether it's even members in elected office or or just folks uh, looking for a little bit of help and getting a leg up in a difficult economy in other ways, and they're just not getting it, and yet they're expected to toe the line regardless of whether or not they're actually benefiting by policies of this administration. So... Not exactly sure what the numbers would need to be in some of these states uh, from the black vote to help get the Democratic candidates over the top. But um, given where the enthusiasm level is right now, it doesn't look like it's going to be that easy to get there. Is that your read as well? Yeah, and I, I think that it has to do not only with the uh, with the president's unpopularity, but also um, with the fact that the turnout in midterm elections is is lower, and it's just very difficult to get the turnout for uh, the party that's in power. It's generally less enthusiastic to come out in a midterm. So I think just the basic midterm election pattern is going to make it very difficult to get that sort of turnout. More on that in the crazy martini, I promise you. Uh, On to the bad martini now, and this is courtesy of the Sunday New York Times. Quote, no one knows if the Obama administration will manage in the next five weeks to strike what many in the White House consider the most important foreign policy deal of his presidency, in accord with Iran that would forestall its ability to make a nuclear weapon. But the White House has made one significant decision. If agreement is reached, President Obama will do everything in his power to avoid letting Congress vote on it. Even while negotiators argue over the number of centrifuges Iran would be allowed to spin and where inspectors could roam, the Iranians have signaled that they would accept, at least temporarily, a suspension of the stringent sanctions that have drastically cut their oil revenues 
and terminated their banking relationships with the West, according to American and Iranian officials. The Treasury Department, in a detailed study it declined to make public, has concluded Mr. Obama has the authority to suspend the vast majority of those sanctions without seeking a vote by Congress. And so this is right along the lines of other things we've seen, Eliana, whether it's immigration, whether it's Guantanamo Bay and other issues that the president has decided, well, Congress isn't doing what I want, so I'm just not even going to acknowledge that it exists. Uh, But now we're getting into the, the treaty area, and I'm pretty sure that's fairly clear in the Constitution. Exactly. Um, I think this is something Obama certainly has the power to do, but I think what you'll see uh, Republicans in Congress try to do and many of the more hawkish Democrats try to do is pass a bill saying that any deal Obama enters into with Iran will have to be signed on to by Congress, and then they want to put Obama in the position of having to veto that bill, which obviously would put the president in quite a difficult position because there are a number of Democrats, it goes without saying, who would, um, who would sign on to a bill like that. So I think, I think you'll see that um, be the strategy from uh, Republicans and more hawkish Democrats in Congress. All right, on to the crazy martini now. And as we said, this kind of goes back to the midterm elections. President Obama has not exactly been welcomed in too many uh, battleground races, particularly on the Senate side. There's really only two governor's races where he's been welcomed in. One is his adopted home state of Illinois, where Pat Quinn is in a very tough race to hold on to the governorship there. The other one is in Maryland, just outside D.C., where Martin O'Malley is retiring and thinking about 2016. His lieutenant governor, Anthony Brown, is leading in the polls, but not by as much as folks might expect in Maryland. So, He had the president out to an event in Prince George's County, Maryland, just outside of D.C. yesterday. And the weirdest thing happened, Eliana. As the president talked, people just started leaving. I mean, this is a guy who had people fainting in the aisles six years ago. Now they don't even (laughs) want to stick around for the end of the speech. Right. Uh, Certainly, I think it's fair to say that the sheen is off. But I think it also matters that uh, the president is campaigning in states and in races where there isn't a whole lot of uh, passion or enthusiasm on either side because those candidates don't want him there. Um, You know, Kay Hagan doesn't want him in North Carolina. Uh, Allison Lundergan Grimes won't even say whether she voted for him. Um, That the same is true um, with a couple of other Democrats in these key races. So the races that he's going into are ones that aren't attracting a tremendous amount of attention or passion from Democrats. So uh, to be fair to the president, uh, you know, I I think it's important to note that. It is. And it's the sixth year of an administration. It's not like George Bush was welcomed to too many places in 2006. So it kind of comes with the territory. Eliana, always good to have you with us. And uh, thanks so much for uh, being here today. Thanks for having me, Greg. Eliana Johnson, the new Washington Bureau Chief for National Review. In for Jim Garrity today, I'm Greg Columbus of Radio America. Please tune in on Tuesday for the next edition of the Three Martini Lunch.